Good morning to all industry colleagues and members of our council. I am Arupin Nath Malik, Arup, and on behalf of the entire Terry team, I welcome you all to today's webinar on transitioning towards a low carbon future of energy in India. I am happy to moderate the session today. As many of you would be aware, our council is a group of Indian business leaders working on a shared commitment to mainstream sustainability in business strategies and practices. We at Terry have set up this council to recognize and promote sustainability leadership practices. Terry Council for Business Sustainability serves as the interface for our research to be connected to the corporate world. We are delighted to host a series of thought leadership webinars that will discuss and deliberate emerging trends on sustainability which Indian companies and businesses should be cognizant about. The, the webinar shall last for 60 minutes. The webinar is an interactive session and all of you would have an opportunity to pose questions and queries to the, to the speaker during the course of the webinar. You can type your questions in the chat box available on the right hand side corner of your screen. The speaker will address your questions by turn. In case you are unable to hear us or view the display, please contact my colleagues. The mobile number is available on the, on the screen. About today's webinar on transitioning towards a uh, you know, low carbon future of energy in India. India at the crossroads of its development has a unique opportunity to charter its own low carbon pathways with Indian businesses on board towards achieving this aspiration. The energy demand patterns are also undergoing changes due to urbanization, increased space conditioning loads, and adoption of energy efficiency initiatives. We at Terry believe that it is prudent to start preparing for the disruptions to come in the energy and the power sector in India in the coming decades due to this shift towards a low carbon pathway for energy generation. The participation and support of the Indian companies and businesses is essential in this preparedness to facilitate a smooth transition. Today's webinar will deliberate on ways in which energy transitions across the world are influencing and shaping the energy scenario in the view of climate and environmental concerns. In today's webinar, we have, we have two, two speakers. I'm happy to introduce our first speaker, Lord Eder Turner. Lord Eder Turner chairs the Energy Transition Commission. He's a businessman, academic, and former chairman of the Financial Services Authority. He has chaired the Pensions Commission, the Low Pay Commission, and the Committee on Climate Change in the UK. He was instrumental to set up McKinsey's practice in Eastern Europe and Russia. He was the Director General of the Confederation of British Industries and the Vice Chairman of Merrill Lynch Europe. He, he was also a you know, non-executive director of a number of companies including Standard Chartered, Oak North, and Prudential PLG. As well as being chairman of the Institute for New Economic Thinking, Lord Edward Turner is a visiting professor at London School of Economics and the Cass Business School. Recently, Lord Turner was amongst us during the launch of the Energy Transition Commission uh, India on 15th February in New Delhi. While he could not join us today live, we have a video message which we shall see and hear now. The Energy Transition Commission is a global coalition of the willing, you might uh, call it, uh, combining major corporations from the US, from France, from the UK, from China, from India, with major, uh, highly respected uh, environmental NGOs such as Energy, uh, European Climate Foundation, uh, Rocky Mountain Institute and, and many others. And this group of organizations has come together to try and describe the way in which we can build across the world low carbon and eventually zero carbon economies but while still meeting the needs of the world and in particular 
the needs of developing countries for significant increase in energy requirements to drive prosperity. Last year, we produced our first flagship report called Better Energy, Greater Prosperity. And in it, we described an optimistic point of view about how technology has made it more probable that we can build low carbon economies at low cost, but also flagged some of the really big challenges uh, which we face in heading towards a low carbon economy. We talked about four major thrusts of how we must achieve this transition uh, to a different energy system. The first is to decarbonize electricity generation and to apply electricity to as much of the economy as possible. And here there is for the world a very good news story. I think we're on the verge of a sort of next stage, a next industrial revolution driven essentially by wider electrification but above all by clean electrification. I was the first chair of the UK's climate change committee back in 2008. That's the body which in the UK is charged with driving the UK's move towards dramatic carbon reduction, uh, uh, carbon emissions reductions. And if you'd asked me then, how do we decarbonize an electricity system, I'd have said you have to use three different technologies, nuclear, renewables and carbon capture and storage. What has happened over the 10 years since then, and which we set out in this report, Better Energy, Greater Prosperity, is that the progress of renewable energy technologies, the cost reduction of wind and solar, and the cost reduction in particular of batteries, has been so dramatic that we can now envisage the possibility within 10 or 15 or 20 years of building electricity generation systems which are 85 or 90 percent, we describe it as near total, 85 or 90 percent dependent on intermittent renewables, wind and solar, and do so at a cost which is fully competitive for fossil fuels. This is a real new fact, this is a new breakthrough uh, in the economics, it's news to me over the last 10 years, I didn't anticipate it 10 years ago, but it's a hugely positive development. We believe, and we set out in that report, that we will be able, let us say by 2030, if you are building uh, energy system a new, uh, electricity system a new, to build a system where you would deliver 24 hour uh, a day, seven days uh, a week, uh, 52 weeks a year, electricity at an average cost of seven US cents per kilowatt hour or below and do it almost entirely with renewables, with all the storage and backup which is required for a renewable system. So that's step one of what we set out in Better Energy, Greater Prosperity, and it's a very optimistic story. But it's not enough. The other three things that we need to do to build low carbon and then zero carbon economies is first, to work out what to do about all the sectors of the economy which are more difficult to electrify. These are things like long distance trucking, aviation, shipping, steel production, cement production. Here, it's less easy to say you just decarbonize the electricity and then you electrify. If you were, for instance, talking about light duty vehicles, cars, we are very optimistic about the future of the electric car and provided we decarbonize the electricity generation, then moving to electric cars is also fantastic for the local environment, very important here in Delhi, getting the air quality better, but also very uh, positive for the global climate. But when you get to trucking and aviation and shipping, shipping, it's a bit more complicated. So that's step two which we require alongside decarbonizing electricity is to deal with these other sectors of the economy which are more difficult to electrify. Step three is a radical improvement in energy efficiency and step four is within the fossil fuels that we are using to shift from dirty fossil fuels like coal to somewhat cleaner, though not fully clean, uh, fossil fuels uh, like gas. So that's the overall story that we set out in Greater energy, uh, better energy, greater prosperity, our flagship report last year. On the basis of that report, 
The ETC is now doing two major initiatives in the current year. One is focused here in India. It is the launch of ETC India, which I am here for uh, in Delhi uh, this week. And what we've done with ETC India is to say, let's take our vision of the ability eventually to build near total renewable systems, and let's see how it works in India. Parallel with the ETC report last year, Terry, here in India, produced a report which argued that India did not need to build more coal-fired power stations beyond the 40 gigawatts under construction. That beyond that, it could drive a very significant increase in energy demand, electricity demand, from 1,000 terawatt hours up to maybe even 3,000 terawatt hours by 2030, 2035, but do it almost entirely with renewables. And if that's right, that would be hugely important for India's local air quality, for India's economy, for the global climate in itself, because limiting coal use in India is materially important for the global climate, but also would be an important demonstration to other developing countries which are trying to work out whether to drive their economic growth with coal or renewables. So this week we're launching ETC India uh, with corporate support here in India, uh, major uh, philanthropic foundation uh, support to uh, a support a major program of analysis looking at Indian electricity demand, supply, flexibility, how you manage the grid to really work out can we in India move rapidly beyond coal and build a renewable electricity system and then electrify more of the economy, uh, both in the urban areas and in the rural areas. I absolutely believe from the technological possibilities that this is possible and that the emergence of a green electricity system in India will be a huge economic opportunity that will end up lower cost uh, than a coal-based system, uh, that it will create jobs, uh, and that it will be a hugely important contribution of India to the global fight against climate change. So that's one of the two big initiatives we're doing this year on the back of our initial report. The other, which we are doing out of ETC Global, is a focus on the harder to abate sectors, on trucking, on aviation, on shipping, on steel and cement, and on plastics and chemicals. And here one interesting theme is emerging. We began by thinking these would be sectors which is much harder to electrify. But it turns out that a lot of the answers in those sectors are electrification direct or indirect. In the long run, to decarbonize steel, Essentially, we will have to use one of two technologies. We will either have to apply carbon capture and storage, or we will have to use hydrogen as a reduction agent rather than coking coal at carbon. If we are using hydrogen as a reduction agent, that is green if the hydrogen is coming from electrolysis, which means more green electricity to support it. And in trucking, there are really a small number of ways forward. There might be biofuels in the long term. There are synthetic fuels, but synthetic fuels essentially again come from electricity. Or there is hydrogen, but a hydrogen again comes from electricity if it's going to be green. Or there is battery-based uh, uh, trucking. So what is interesting about the harder to abate sectors is you come back again to the centrality of electrification. There is no way that the world economy is going to deal with the challenge of climate change which does not involve decarbonizing electricity production as rapidly as possible and then applying electricity to as wide a range of economic activities as uh, we possibly can. But the good news is the technological advances which are occurring in renewables and in batteries in particular, but also in things like electrolysis and fuel cells, really give us a vision of an economy which is a very attractive economy, an economy which can deal with climate change, which can dramatically improve things like local air quality, but which can do it cheap enough that we can continue to grow 
electricity and energy demand in countries like India which need that to drive uh, prosperity and we can create jobs and prosperity as well. So I am a real optimist that there is a way forward uh, which is good for the environment and good for economic growth and that is what ETC India, uh, which I'm here uh, in India this week uh, helping to launch, uh, is really all about. Thank you very much. That was ladies and gentlemen, Lord Adair Turner, articulate and inspiring as always. Our second speaker today is Dr. Ajay Mathur. Dr. Ajay Mathur is our Director General at Interi and he is also a member of the Prime Minister's Council on Climate Change. He was the Director, of, Director General of the Bureau of Energy Efficiency in the Government of India earlier and was responsible for bringing energy efficiency into our homes, offices and factories through initiatives such as the Star Labeling Program for Appliances, the Energy Conservation Building Code and the Perform, Achieve and Trade Program for Energy Intensive Industries. Dr. Mathur was uh, earlier the President of Suzlon Energy Limited and also headed the Interim Secretariat of the Green Climate Fund. He has been a key cli Indian climate change negotiator and was also the Indian spokesperson at the 2015 climate negotiation, negotiations in Paris. He is a global leader on technological approaches to address climate change and is also co-chair of the Energy Transition Commission, a global group of industrial, financial and think tank leaders focusing on strategies for companies and countries to move towards climate friendly energy future. Dr. Mathur is joining us live at this webinar. Dr. Mathur shall, shall illustrate how the Energy Transition Commission India is, a, is, is an unique multi-stakeholder platform to deliberate on and shape the energy sector transition scenarios for India for the years to come. The initiative shall engage with leading private and public sector utilities and industrial firms, the banking and the finance industry, policymakers and regulators, system operators, academic and research community. Over to Dr. Martin. Uh, Arun, thank you very much and a very good morning to all colleagues who are joining on this uh, webcast. Uh, this webinar will, I hope, take us ahead in this transition that we are undergoing in the energy area. Uh, as uh, my colleague uh, Adair Turner pointed out, the kinds of changes that are happening, the drivers because of climate change on the one hand, and the huge price reductions that are happening as far as solar is concerned, as far as wind, as far as batteries, all of this mean that tomorrow is not going to be the same as yesterday. Now, having said that, what it implies is that there are huge challenges for India. If we look at the Indian economy, um, you know, there are about 45 sectors who collectively uh, constitute the vast bulk of the economic output that the Indian economy enjoys, the highly energy intensive uh, uh, sectors uh, in the Indian economy uh, and you know for the purposes of uh, uh, a rule of thumb, uh, sectors which use uh, pro approximately 10% <coughs> Uh, of their uh, sectoral output is an energy input, and that's very large. So, you know, of their output, 10% is the energy costs. They, they together uh, constitute something like one third of the total economic output of the country. Obviously, we know steel, we know cement, we know, you know, the power sector is one of those. Uh, then there are uh, uh, sectors such as uh, aluminum uh, and so on. Now, all of these sectors are today facing a challenge. The demand in India is growing, but on the other hand, in, in order to remain competitive, we need to make sure that the prices, their prices keep declining, they continue to become more and more competitive. 
And the way they can be competitive is by reducing their energy costs. And uh, uh, the slide that you see uh, shows the distribution of uh, the uh, uh, sectors on the y-axis is the amount of energy uh, costs as a function of their out total out sectoral output, and on the x-axis is how much do they contribute to the national economy. And therefore, what it tells us is that for a very large part of the Indian economy, how we handle energy, how we handle energy costs is going to be amazingly important for our competitiveness or productivity for ensuring that jobs are created and that the standard of living of people in India keeps on increasing. Now, if we look at how we have used energy, this particular chart tells you, and you know, India is the line that you see, the, the series of dots uh, declining over a period of time. Uh, on the X scale is the GDP per capita per year, and on the Y scale is the amount of energy that we use uh, as a function of the total GDP, so the energy intensity of the economy. So the energy intensity of the economy is on the Y axis and the per capita GDP is on the X axis. And the series of dots that you see is how, India, how India's energy economy has declined while its per capita GDP has increased. The dashed line shows for all Asia. And again, what you see is that, uh, you know, these are countries with various kinds of uh, per capita incomes, and they are all contained uh, in the curve, uh, in, in the area which is shown by this curve. What this tells us is that as we move ahead, there are huge opportunities for enhancing energy efficiency. And that's largely because every new industry that is built, every new house that is built, every new office that is built, every new car that is bought today is more efficient than the one that brought, was brought in yesterday. And that is why as we go into the future, if we are able to have competitive markets, if we are able to have specifications, we will move towards energy efficiency. There is a very strong productivity and competitiveness reasons which pull us in that direction. So the first slide said that energy is important. The second tells us that energy costs are extremely important. They are declining and there is a very strong driver which is pulling us in ensuring that the kinds, that the ways in which we access energy reduce in the future. Now, if you look at where we are going, Clearly, the amount of energy that is being met by fossil fuels and the prices of fossil fuels are either remaining constant or are declining, or are increasing, sorry. On the other hand, as we noted, the prices of renewables are declining. How do we as a country, how do we as companies take advantage of this transition? And this is not only in India, this is across the world. If you look, look across the world, what we see is that the addition in capacity that has occurred over the last year in 2017, the renewables capacity addition has outpaced the fossil fuel-based electricity addition. And that's simply because of this economic rationale. Uh, the in many, many markets, including India, the price of electricity from solar, at least when the sun is shining, is already less than the price of electricity from coal. Yes, it is true that the price of electricity from uh, solar in the night is much higher because then you need to store it somewhere, either as batteries or something else, and therefore that cost is higher. But when the sun is shining, we have already crossed that first economic transition, as I call it, in which the prices are less than those of uh, coal. And therefore, what you see is across the world, the amount of solar energy, the amount of wind energy, 
renewables that are added is more than the amount of fossil fuel based electricity generation capacity. If we look at prices in India, and this is the price of uh, solar, what you see is the price decline in solar. And we see that uh, in the year 1718, this particular year, we saw the economic transition that the price of solar is now, the price of solar without storage is now less than the price of uh, the coal-based electricity, or actually the, uh, 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 av av the average tariff on uh, coal. Now, as we move to the future, as uh, Adair Turner had mentioned earlier, what is important is that we are able to get the use of this solar electricity at the time when we want it. If I look at our own example at Terry here in Delhi, we installed solar panels on the roof of our building. They meet about one third of the energy demand of the India Habitat Center during the day. And it is a third party who set up the solar panel and we buy electricity from him. And we buy electricity at about 5.5 rupees a kilowatt hour, whereas what we pay NDMC for our electricity is about 7.2 rupees a kilowatt hour. Across the country, in every state of the country, the price for electricity to commercial buildings is higher than the cost of electricity from solar if it is installed on their rooftop. So again, I would suggest that at least in one large market, the transition has already occurred. And therefore, if you can use up all the electricity that a solar panel on your roof can use, even today, you are better off than buying electricity from the grid. Now, as we move ahead, the issue is what are the kinds of things that we need to worry about? And I would suggest that there is a huge issue in how energy prices will increase in the years to come. Uh, there has been significant uncertainty and volatility. And what this means is that we are in a future where the price of electricity, the price of fuels, is going to show a lot more volatility than it has in the past. This means that there would need to be risk management measures against those times of high prices. The second is that we are looking at a future in which carbon pricing will become important. Looking at 2030 and the kinds of pledges that India has made as part of the Climate Change Convention, we said that at least 40% of the electricity generating capacity of the country in 2030 would be non-fossil fuels. Now, non-fossil fuels means nuclear, it means large hydro, and it means solar and wind. So clearly we are foreseeing a large increase in this area, but, and we'll probably be able to meet this because of the kinds of price reductions that are occurring. But in the years ahead, as the challenge of meeting our climate goals becomes larger, the issue would be what are the kinds of tools that are available to us as a country in order to ensure that the emissions from fossil fuels keep declining. And my suggestion is, my impression is, that we will see carbon pricing emerging as a tool. There is some amount of carbon pricing that already occurs. This is the 400 rupees per ton cess on coal that already exists. Um, I would venture to suggest that in the years beyond 2030, this would become uh, higher as well as uh, larger in scope. So the issues that we are looking at is what is it that we can do to is important, decarbonization of the electricity sector is important, and that electrification in those sectors where it is possible 
is the third step. The fourth, of course, is the hard to decarbonize sectors, uh, and uh, uh, you know the ATC globally is working on that. So the questions that you see here, the uncertainties, the integration of more and more renewables into the electricity sector, is what we look at addressing in the Indian Energy Transitions Commission, which, as uh, Arup mentioned, is a group of stakeholders. These are energy generating companies, energy using companies, uh, academics, and so on. And the goal is that we look at these kinds of options do the analysis that is needed Lower carbon energy future than would happen otherwise. Uh, we look forward to uh, uh, the discussion uh, uh, on uh, uh, these kinds of challenges uh, that we face. Uh, we, as the ETC India, uh, are a set of diverse stakeholders, but I think these are the key stakeholders whose actions would make a difference in the way we look at a more robust energy future uh, for us. So, to end, we look at the challenges of how demand will grow. We are seeing an increasing volatility on the demand side. How the supply will grow, and again, the volatility that is associated with the intermittent sources of wind and solar are a challenge. So if you've got growing volatility on the demand side and growing volatility on the supply side, managing those two, integrating those two is a non-trivial challenge. At the same time, in order to achieve this, what are the kinds of technological issues and market development that is needed so that this kind of integration can occur and the kind of policy transitions that, the policy interventions that can enable a smoother transition. We look forward to the discussion. We look forward to your uh, interventions, ideas, and suggestions. Thank you very much for joining us. And I think we now look forward to questions uh, and any suggestions that you may have. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Mahfoud. I'm sure for all, uh, all the participants, this has been very, very insightful. We clearly see from both the video and Dr. Mathur's presentation the importance of being ready for this transition and the kind of issues that this transition will throw up. I already see a lot of questions from the, uh, from the participants. We shall now take up each one of them, which Dr. Mathur shall address. In case you, you have still not sent us your question, send it in the, in the chat box uh, now. The, the first question that that we uh, that we have, Dr. Mathur, from the from the participants, uh, uh, Lord Turner talked about you know, the the techniques for decarbonizing electricity. The question is, if you could explain more about you know, the uh, about carbon capture and its importance in India. Um, you will note that the four categories, the four buckets of actions that the ATG looked at were enhancing energy productivity, number one, decarbonizing the electricity sector, that means increasing the amount of renewables in the electricity sector, that's number two. The third is moving to electrification wherever possible, for example, electric vehicles, you move away from petrol and move towards electricity, and if the electricity sector is decarbonizing, then clearly the places where you use electric vehicles also have a lower carbon emission. But then, as uh, uh, Adair Turner said, there is this huge group of applications, the very energy intensive applications, steel, cement, uh, aviation, uh, uh, heavy duty transport, where we actually don't have uh, solutions, what we call as the difficult to decarbonize sectors. As we move ahead, 
we will need to figure out what we do with the difficult to decarbonize sectors. This is something that the Energy Transitions Commission, the Global Energy Transitions Commission is looking at right now. We hope to bring out a analysis of the kinds of options that are available by June this year. But what are the kinds of options? We are looking at two broad array of uh, options. The first option is, is it possible to use fuels that are low or zero carbon? So gas could be a bridge fuel. It's a low carbon fuel. It's not a zero carbon fuel. But we could also look at fuels tomorrow, which are third generation biofuels. Or we could look at hydrogen that is produced by the electrolysis of water with electricity from PV cells. So those would be fuels which uh, could replace fuels in the places where electrification is not possible. The other option could be if we are unable or if it is not cost effective, then the last option we have is carbon capture and storage. Or as the group has said, we focus on carbon capture and utilization. Uh, this is, in a sense, the last option that we have. It is also an option on which the technology interventions have been relatively limited. So there is very limited understanding both of the performance in terms of how much carbon you can capture, how long you can keep it underground, what is leakages, as well as some costs. So today there is a feeling that the costs would be somewhere in the vicinity of $100 per ton of carbon dioxide. But is this the ultimate price? Would it be less than that? Again, there is very little knowledge. So in this last sector, the difficult to decarbonize sectors, whether we move to low and zero carbon fuels or whether we move to carbon capture and utilization, there are huge technological and price challenges to which we actually do not have answers today. I think it is best summarized by a sentence which appeared in The Economist a couple of years ago, uh, writing about carbon capture and storage with the set, at, word, at best, it will be very expensive, and at worst, it won't work. And I think that captures the dilemma that we face with carbon capture and storage. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Uh, the, the second question that we have uh, is, uh, there are a, a number of participants who are, who are asking for the um, the web link where you can access the Better Energy, Greater Prosperity report, as well as a copy of the of the of the presentation. Uh, we will soon after the, the, the webinar, we will, we will share the web link to all the all the participants for the uh, for the, the Better Energy, Greater Prosperity report. The copy of uh, the present Dr. Markle's presentation and the copy of the, the recorded version of the webinar would be made available to you later during this week. So, uh, you know, we will send you the web link, but if you go to the Energy Transitions Commission and the publications, you will see the report and you can actually download it. But we will send you the URL link. And as uh, Arun said, both the, uh, the presentation that I made as well as the uh, video uh, uh, the, uh, video link to uh, uh, Lord Adair Turner's, Turner's presentation would also be available. The, the next set of questions, Dr. Mathur, that we have from the participants are more from the uh, from the, from the supply uh, from the supply side. Uh, two two questions we have uh, on, on on similar uh, similar lines. The first is by 2040, how much percentage of ele electrical energy in the national grid will be renewable? And the second is 2017 to 2030 during this period. Will the supply options change drastically? So, as far as the first question is concerned, what will be the percentage of electricity which will come from renewables in 2040 is concerned? We will be able to provide you with a better answer in about two months' time. This is a study that is going on. But rule of thumb, uh, something of the order of 30% is where it probably will be. 
But this 30% depends on the answer to the next question, which is what are the kinds of supply changes that will occur between now and 2020. So as I mentioned, one economic transition has already occurred, which is that the cost of electricity from solar is less than the cost of electricity from coal while the sun is shining. If we are able to reach a price point for batteries, for storage, which is approximately half of where it is today, then we will be able to produce firm electricity, solar plus batteries, at about 5 rupees per kilowatt hour. Now, why is 5 rupees important? Because if you start setting up a power station in about 2024, 20, 2025, 20, 20, 2026, 20, which is, uh, you know, supercritical, ultra supercritical in that category, and has got the, and meets the emission norms that have been recently introduced two years ago, if you do that, then the price of electricity from coal will be about 5 rupees per kilowatt hour. So if solar plus batteries are able to produce electricity at less than 5 rupees per kilowatt hour, then the new capacity addition that will occur beyond, say, 2024, 20, 25, 26 would be solar plus batteries rather than coal. So the future of high renewable firm electricity, which is economically competitive, really depends on the price of batteries halving between now and the mid-2020s. If we are able to meet this goal, then the question, the first question that was there on how and you know the 30% electricity use in 2040 would become possible. Thank you, Dr. Mathur. The next set of uh, questions are more in terms of the uh, the participation and engagement for the businesses with Energy Transition Commission uh, India. Uh, the first question uh, is how will the corporate sector participate and engage with ETC India? Second related question, would ETC in India be focusing on only electricity generation or the energy consuming uh, uh, industry? So. Uh, the, we look forward to very strong and as inclusive as possible uh, 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 participation of the corporate sector in the Energy Transitions Commission. If your organization would like to participate in the Energy Transitions Commission, please drop us an email. We would be very happy to see how it can be included. The organizations that are already there are putting are putting in a lot of effort in terms of the time of people, in terms of contributing to the financial viability of the project, and in terms of outreach. So we look forward to inputs, and we also look forward to the companies that are part of the ETC process to become ambassadors of the goals that we uh, that the ETC India together uh, achieves. On the issue of what we will do, in the near future, till about one year from now, we are largely focusing on electricity. But we will focus in the time beyond that on other issues. We, it's not yet clear where, what the next uh, uh, focus will be, it could either be enhanced energy efficiency or it could be looking at the difficult to decarbonize sectors uh, in India. But uh, th that is the current game plan and the ETC members during this year would finalize on what are the choices for the next piece of work that ETC India focuses on. Thank you, Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, a real good question has also come in. But, uh, can ETC uh, sponsor pilot or demo projects to show the viability in the business model towards a low uh, carbon energy? That is, uh, carbon capture and reuse, battery integration into renewables, hydrogen generation using renewable power, basically all the options that are being referred 
who need to be actually demonstrated on the ground. ETC is a group, a collection, a coalition of various organizations who are concerned about the energy use of the future. We look forward to these organizations uh, putting up the questions that they have, which are together uh, addressed by the Energy Transitions Commission. And that there is a broad ownership of the kinds of solutions, the kinds of options to these questions. We also look at the members of the ETC and actually beyond that to be the ambassadors both in terms of speaking and talking and writing, but also in terms of their investments. So if a member of the ETC who is, say, a energy producer or a steel producer is convinced about a ETC um, a report, for example, that carbon capture and storage is the cost effective, is the first thing to do as far as... Uh, um, um, uh, addressing emissions in the power sector or the steel sector are concerned, we hope that they will be convinced enough to invest in it. In other words, the ETC itself is not focusing on either technology or on investments. What it is focusing on is learning what is happening and, carry, and carrying out the kind of analysis that the corporate sector needs in order to decide whether it wants to invest in those options. Thank you, Dr. Mahu. Uh, the next set of questions is on your point on uh, India's uh, plans and strategies for introducing carbon pricing. The questions are, how carbon pricing is going to evolve in India and how power generators like CLP India need to strategize with respect to carbon pricing or carbon tax. The second uh, uh, similar question is there has been a lot of discussions on carbon pricing. Is it clearly an additional tax on fossil fuel? Who pays to whom in carbon pricing? And does this mechanism make the, the big emitters pay to the, to the small emitters. Okay. Uh, this is a complex uh, question because there are multiple questions if you look at different things. So let me first address what we have today. The only thing that we have today is the cess on coal, which is 400 rupees per ton of coal. So the coal companies, when they sell their coal, for example, to the power generators, charge them this extra 400 rupees, which then goes into the national uh, exchequer. Uh, till a few months ago, this money was going into what was known as the National Clean Energy Fund, and that had provided resources both as viability gap financing for renewable energy, as well as viability gap financing for green corridors, the transmission lines from power stations to load centers. But subsequent to the GST coming in force, the entire cess on coal, the 400 rupees per ton, is now going towards meeting the GST compensations. So at least for a, I think, five-year period, if I'm not wrong, uh, the GST compensation period, uh, this cess is not going to be available for any other source. It is, so this is the, this is the facts on the ground. And let's look at the future. It is fairly clear that with the co current coal power stations, uh, the capacity far exceeding the economic sales that are happening, I don't think that there will be efforts to increase the amount of the coal sets. It will remain at 400 rupees till the current uh, uh, fleet of, of coal power stations reach a relatively high plant load factor. Beyond that, I do expect 
that the cold sets would increase. That's number one. The second issue is the broader carbon tax levied by the government, not only on coal, but on other fuels as well, petroleum fuels as well. It is my feeling, and please understand that I am saying this only uh, as a basis of my analysis, my feeling is that we will not see a, a carbon price, a national carbon price before 2030. And the reason is that I think we will be able to meet the target for the halving of battery costs by the middle of 2020s, which means that we will be able to meet the car, the Paris pledge of 40% electricity generation capacity being non-fossil fuel. In other words, we'll be able to meet our commitments without any further government diktat. Now, the problem will come what happens beyond 2030. In 2030, we will be in a situation where the world will realize that we need to do much more action than has been done. And at that point, a whole slew of new instruments to push investments towards renewables rather than fossil fuels will come into play. My expectation is that in the post-2030 period, we will probably see a, nation, a national carbon tax emerging as a tool to push investments towards renewables. This is as far as the government is concerned. There's one more part of it, which is internal carbon pricing. It's not a tax, it's an internal carbon pricing. Now, several companies in India, and I think the first was the Mahindra Group, who said, when we are making internal investments, we will try to see what is the carbon implication of this investment, and not just see it in numbers, but put a rupee figure to the carbon emissions. And then see if the options that we are looking at as far as investments are concerned would be different. So the short answer to that is that several Indian companies have already adopted various forms of internal carbon pricing. And I expect that this is going to increase as the companies start thinking about how do they move towards a lower carbon future. Thank you, Dr. Mathur. We are increasingly getting you know, uh, questions from, from participants, but with, uh, with our limited time, we'll be only be able to take you know, one set, last set of, of, of questions. Uh, the, the last set of questions, Dr. Mathur, is on the increasing share of renewables. Question one on this on this topic is whether the life cycle impact of renewables is being taken into, into consideration. The, the, ba the batteries, the, the solar systems, etc. And the second point is that the Central Electricity Authority CEA version 12, the emission factor per megawatt hour of electricity is 0.82 tons of CO2 per uh, megawatt hours. It is constant for the, the mm -hmm. last two to three years. If the question is, if renewable en energy percentage is increasing day by day, why this factor is not reduced? Okay. So let me take the first one, uh, the second question first. Uh, if you look at the electricity generation in India, the electricity from wind and solar is increasing, but the generation from large hydro is either declining or remaining constant. So the increases from solar and wind have been matched by declines from large hydro. This is the reason why the uh, carbon uh, factor, uh, the carbon intensity of the Indian electricity sector has remained more or less constant. Uh, climate change will bring about changes in the hydro hydrological patterns in the country and therefore the amount of electricity that can be generated for hydro, I think this is a shape of things to come. That's number one. The other question uh, related to how do we look at the costs of uh, solar and wind are these life cycle costs. We have to move towards life cycle costing soon. 
The problem is that today we do not have an idea of what these costs will be like. At Terry, we have started work on the handling of handling and costs of the solar module wastes and the battery wastes at the end of life. What are the technologies that are needed? What are the kind of prices that are needed? And I'll share with you my own feeling is that both solar and batteries should be charged a certain amount right up front when they are sold. And this additional money is put into a fund which is then used for managing their phase out at the end of life. It's not happened, but it has to happen. Thank you, Dr. Mahathir. On, on behalf of all our council members, I'd like to thank Dr. Ajay Turner and Dr. Ajay Mathur for today's uh, for their in insightful inputs. Thank you, importantly, to not take any more questions from the participants that came to us at a later stage. Please expect a communication from our end soon with the details of upcoming engagements under the Energy Transition Commission India Initiative. The recording of this webinar would be made available on the Terry CPS website by Friday, later during this week. From our end, a communication will reach to all the registered participants where you can access the, the recorded version and the presentation of the webinar today. Before we part ways, I'd also like to request you to block your calendars for our upcoming, uh, our upcoming engagements. The India-Japan Economic and Energy Seminar being organized in association with New Energy and Industrial Technology Development Organization, NIDO, and Japan External Trade Organization, JETRO, on 1st May 2018 in New Delhi. In its eighth annual edition, the seminar shall comprise focused discussion on synergies with the Government of India missions of Make in India and Startup India, along with, interestingly, two panel discussions on Clean Air India, exploring technological options for emission improvements, and the concept of virtual power plants by using electric vehicles. Please expect a communication from us soon with the registration details. You could also write to my colleague, Mr. Karthik Dubey, requesting for additional details and to get yourself registered. His email ID is on the screen. Next, the second thought leadership webinar of our council is on Sustainability Trends 2018, which is scheduled on 9th of May 2018, 3.30 p.m. onwards. This webinar should help all of you to identify you know, global trends and issues to undertake materiality assessment internally for your organization. Please look forward to our communication on the chain. You could write to my colleague, Ms. Preeti Batla, requesting for additional details and to get yourself registered. Her email ID is on the screen. Our Council for Business Sustainability serves as the interface for our research work to be connected to the corporate world and enables a two-way communication and engagement. For regular updates and our annual plans of engagement with all our member companies during this financial year, please visit our website or write to us on the, on the email IDs given on the screen. You can either consider uh, writing to me, uh, uh, Arup Malik, or my senior director, Mr. Puneet Chandra. Thank you for your presence today with us. I'm signing off and wish you a good day ahead. Thank you. And